All right, thank you for the introduction. This is actually going to be a co-presentation by myself and my co-authors, Palini and Sayandeep. And what we're going to talk about is a project and hopefully a community that we're trying to build around trying to address the heterogeneity in eBPF. And more specifically, we're trying to make it possible to actually think about eBPF as modular programs that get composed together. I think at this point in time, when you think about people using eBPF programs, you're thinking of one of maybe two use cases. Uh, the first is for observability, and essentially we're going online, we're getting these tools from you know Brendan Gregg's website or from some other open source repositories. We're downloading these tools, we're using them. If we have challenges that these tools can't address, we write whole new programs. Uh, and so we're creating a bunch of monolith programs where there is no reuse in code for observability. The other side of the spectrum, you look at uh, places like Facebook, uh, you look at Cloudflare, you look at um, Cilium, they are building their own eBPF programs, which have very rich, complex functionality. And yet each of these programs are themselves monoliths. There might be some overlap in functionality, but they're not able to reuse functionality. They essentially end up rewriting code over and over again. So the state of the art is if you want an eBPF program, you start from scratch and you write all of your own code. And it's hard to essentially borrow code from other people, or it's hard to think of other people's code as modules that you can incorporate because of several different challenges. So try and understand these challenges. Let's try and think about what happens if you're trying to use code from an online eBPF module that or online eBPF program that you have found or discovered. The first step is basically, you know, going online, finding the function of interest, determining what the lines of those functions are, and then trying to pull this function into your code. And this is where everything becomes very tricky because now not just the lines of this function, but you need to understand what are the data structures that this function depends on? What are the other functions that this function depends on? So now you're going through the code reading around a bunch of different potential components uh, of different files to understand the whole dependency structure. And failure to get this right means your program will not run. Uh, and if you are lucky, the code you found runs at a different hook point. For example, you are looking at Catran, and there are a lot of interesting things there, but it runs at the XDP hook point. What you're writing maybe runs at the SOC hook point. Now, you need to go through and rewrite significant portions to get it to run at the hook point you care about. And so trying to think about online programs or programs that are open source as modules that you can incorporate is non-trivial and extremely hard to get right. The goal of our project and our vision is essentially to automate this process of extracting the function and potentially also transforming the function to work at different hook points. And what we believe the future should be is essentially a developer should be able to just pick a module or pick you know a function in an open source repository and start to build on it and we our tool our framework should automate the extraction and the transformation process that hides all of the complexities of identifying dependencies of rewriting hook point specific primitives and there are a couple of challenges to trying to get this right. Uh, and more specifically, there are challenges in trying to reduce the time it takes for a developer to introduce and develop new functionality. Uh, obviously, automating extraction, automating transformation, but more importantly, one of the things we're hoping this framework will do is to put the developer as a first order primitive. Essentially, we want the extraction and the transformation to be guided by the developer, by the developer's goals, the developer's needs. And thus, a key part of our framework is to essentially have developers guide um, our automated tool. In terms of the roadmap, my colleague, Sayandeep, will talk about the extraction. Uh, he'll talk about the transformation. And my colleague, Polini, will talk about the demo and some of what we are hoping to do as we try to build this community. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Sainte. Thanks, Theo. Um, am I audible? 
Yes, you are. Okay, great. Um, just to see. Okay, I need to click. Great. Um, so, yeah, like Theo said, uh, the first task we want to handle as part of our framework is being able to extract a user uh, a developer identified function as an independently loadable module, right, from a big code repository, right? So what does that uh, task entail, right? It entails identifying all the dependencies of that specific eBPF function, right? Uh, dependencies would could be uh, the code for the entire function call graph for this specific um, function any function or another level down function which can get invoked right code for those uh, any map or data structures that gets used anywhere in this function call graph and also the header files which are included for uh, other necessary processing so this is the set of dependency that we identify and during the process of extraction we want to uh, take only the minimum required uh, code extract minimum required code mostly to ensure uh, increase the chances of uh, our extraction being correct and minimizing technical debt right i mean eventually you can always take the entire folder and it runs don't want to do that uh, so one caveat we have for our extraction is that we assume that the entire the or uh, initial big repository of code from which we are to extract uh, passes verification right i mean if you give us code which fails verifiers check uh, high it's it's undecided that whether we will be able to extract a loadable function uh, so the way we uh, ext extract the function is using this tool, uh, extending this tool called Code Query. Now, Code Query is a source code uh, search and querying tool, uh, which internally uses C scope and C tags databases uh, written in SQLite for uh, identifying the location of various functions. So we have extended this tool to recursively uh, uh, identify the function call graph starting from a target uh, function which the developer provides us uh, and we stop the recursion at a point we hit a function which is uh, present in a well-known library like the typical libraries you will find in user include and so on right at which point we will stop creating the function call graph uh, after this we also have uh, created a a TXL source code transformation tool based rule set to take the entire code base and create annotation over it to identify the location of every function. Now, given the function call graph and this uh, annotation, we run a Python script to extract the functions and the header files and dump them into a extracted.c file right so at the end of this extraction uh, the left hand side a yellow box of xdp decap which is a function in ketran would get uh, dumped in a extracted.c file with some provenance on top saying from where it was extracted so this is what extraction does um, for functions now for maps uh, what we do is in the while in the process of doing function call graph uh, traversal we uh, track whether the function is a bpf map update or lookup element function right and for if it is we identify what specific map is getting used right and again we use our excel transformation tool to annotate the location of maps and all other structures and other variables that the map uses in a so annotated source file, combining this uh, information of uh, which maps were used and this uh, annotation, the Python script then extracts and then dumps the structure. So in this case, uh, if the code uses the following two uh, maps, decap dest on LRU map in the original code base, we will dump them in the same extracted.c file.
Okay. Now, obviously, things don't go uh, as smoothly, right? Uh, so actually, this extraction is divided into two phases. At the end of phase one, which happens when the function call graph is generated, what we have realized is a lot of functions as well as structures are double, uh, multiple time defined, mul defined multiple times at different locations, right? Uh, so what we do is at the end of stage one, uh, we ask the developer to step in and take this annotated function call graph, pick the specific instance of the function it wants, right? So for example, in this case, the underlying function, there are two instances, one's in balance account dot three, account dot C line 340 and another one at decap account dot C line 85. Uh, the user needs, uh, developer needs to come in and pick one of them, right? Once this file is cleaned and given, we add, do the actual extraction using the annotation that TXL generated. Okay, so apart from doing uh, the uh, basic extraction, we also ensure a few things. Like we ensure that if there are any preprocessor guards, uh, uh, they are correctly propagated over, right? So essentially, if you have a preprocessor guard and uh, a bunch of functions defined inside, if all, some of them are getting uh, extracted, we will ensure that each one of them get the respective, the right. Uh, guard uh, of uh, preprocessor conditionals. Okay. Uh, we will also ensure, the, given that eBPA functions uh, are mostly static inline uh, functions, uh, it's kind of important to ensure that uh, the way the file is written, uh, the extracted file, the ordering is critical, right? Before you invoke a function, you, you the definition should be uh, uh, present of the function that is going to be invoked. We take care of that. Uh, we also uh, propagate the essential licensing information into the new uh, extracted code file, right? And we copy only the relevant set of uh, hash includes uh, to the to a local extraction folder where the code will get compiled. And for each of these current directory uh, hash includes that we bring in, we add uh, necessary guards of preprocess the uh, preprocessing guards of so that we don't get into trouble with multiple declaration right and right now uh, the make file is something that we hand create but we think it's simple enough to even automate the process of creating a uh, make file for uh, compiling the extracted code okay so this essentially uh, was what we did in extraction. Uh, starting from a big code repository and a user identified function, we would end up uh, hopefully with uh, extracted function and all the other necessary files and a, a handwritten make file. Okay. Uh, now, now comes transformation. Now the goal of transformation as mentioned before is to automatically uh, generate uh, for a given function, which is written uh, for a specific hook point. Uh, we want to automatically generate code for, uh, which works for another target hook point, right? Uh, so you write code for, you write or extract code for XDP, it compiles loads, we want to move it to TC automatically as much as possible. That's the intent. Now, before we go into uh, describing how we go about it, some caveats, right, and nuances. Uh, obviously, code written for one hook point does not work as is or port as is to another hook point, right? You have different header files that you need to include. Actions are defined by different variables. What's XDP drop is TC act short um, and so on, right? Uh, the source of information that the functions get at different hook points is different. At one end, you have XDPMD, another end, you have SKBuff, and so on, right? And the set of helper functions, depending on the hook point you are writing the code for, has uh, subtly different behavior, well documented, but different behavior, uh, right? So that's that's observation one. And more importantly, the second observation is that 
some capabilities are hook point specific, right? For example, BPF redirect maps is something that just works for um, XDP as of this date, and you really don't have an equivalent in TC. If we find those while we are looking at your source code and trying to transform it, uh, we we fail. No magic, we fail, uh, right? But what we what we are see what we have seen is that there are some capabilities which are overlapping right which can be expressed in both the hook points for example if you have an action which involves accessing the five tuple for a packet you can do it even though the syntax is different for different hook points and those syntax changes we can transform so that's that's the that's what we do in transformation right uh, those are uh, okay so with that understanding of transformation, um, what we do in our tool is essentially maintain a database of common uh, uh, transformations for functionalities, right? So for example, if you have a functionality of XDP drop, the database uh, entry corresponding to the TC transformation would be TCL act short, right? Uh, and we essentially are going to use uh, source code transformation tools like Cochinal and TXL, both of which we have used, to start with the input file, find occurrences of these uh, functionalities, and then do the well-known transformation. That's what we end up doing. And if we find a transformation that is known not to be possible, we just declare error and say this is infeasible. And uh, one major point is that right now we have only been working with code transformation from HTTP to TC. We have only been looking at that. Um, okay. So with that definition of transformation, let's just look at some simple or rather kind of transformations that are feasible. Right? Uh, porting a header file from a XDP uh, code to a TCP uh, to a transformed uh, TC code is trivial, right? You just include the right uh, in the header file into the TC uh, file, right? Porting actions is straightforward, right? If the action is drop or pass, uh, transformation is well known, right? XDP drop uh, transforms to TC act short, right? And on the right hand side, I've kind of given a snippet of the rules, which will essentially look at the source code and do this transformation for us. Right? And if transformation is infeasible, for example, XDPTX is something that's hook point specific and doesn't port, we will declare an error and say infeasible. Okay. Uh, similarly, porting the source of information is also straightforward, right? Uh, so, for example, if we are interested in knowing the uh, in in the in the source code. If the if the code is using the Ethernet's H proto, right, where Ethernet points to the beginning of your uh, XDPMD, uh, and we want to transform it to TC, uh, where we we know that this information is available in CTX protocol, where CTX is pointing to escape buff. So on the right hand side, we have a rule which will, uh, I mean, it's dense to parse, but what it does is it ensures that the right hand side entry when it looks into the into this line eth h proto is of type eth header and only if it is of type eth header in the code it is going to replace it with ctx protocol where ctx itself is a escape of right so those kind of transformations are feasible and we do them and finally transforming helper functions is non-trivial uh, uh, some of them are simple because, uh, and and some are complex because uh, you need to know the context uh, of this this transformed code uh, to kind of identify some of the variables that you need to put in, right? So that needs user intervention. So first, a simple one, right? If you have BPF redirect in XDP code, if given XDP only works with ingress. Right. If I were to transform it to a, a equivalent function in TC, I will set the flag to ingress in the TC transformed code, and that's accurate because BPF won't have an option. It's always ingress. 
So this is a straightforward transformation we can do without user intervention. Other times, think of this function like BPF XTP adjust head, right? Which adjusts the buffer size. Uh, the there is an equivalent function in TC layer, uh, which takes information of whether you are using IPv4 or IPv6 as your L3 encapsulation, right? Now this is something that the user needs to specify. This is user available context. So the user needs to step in and write a rule, but still it's something that's doable. So that, that is uh, what we had in terms of talking about transformation. Uh, our current prototype does both. Uh, it's, it's around 1500 lines of code with uh, source uh, code transformation tools of TXL uh, and uh, Cochinel. Uh, and we have been able to run this tool to extract and transform functions from uh, Meta's Katran, uh, Mizar, Surikata, and Cloudflare's XDP drop. Uh, with this, I'm going to transfer to Palini. Um, Theo, can you transfer? I don't know how to transfer, sorry. Already transferred. Already transferred. Palini, you're muted. Palani, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. OK, I'm, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, permission for screen capture needs to be provided. Okay. Hey, uh, looks like I need to allow access, uh, permission to share the screen somewhere here. Sandeep, can you share your screen instead? I think I'll just run it on uh, EBP. OK, let me try. Yeah, it looks like my map, Mac doesn't yet allow me to do this. Um, where Where is the setting? What am I doing? Clicking on plus and on your. Share external video. On your bottom right, there should be a share screen. Share your screen, yes. OK. I shared. Are you sharing your terminal? We we can see your screen at the moment. We're still seeing the slides. Uh, one current prototype. Uh, Sandeep, are you on? Can hear you. I think he got dropped out. He's probably rejoining. Oh, okay. Did you finish joining the presentation? Let me see if I well, let me allow, allow me to do this now. Yeah, he crashed his rejoining. Okay, this is weird.
So if nothing else, send works, it back. Send it back so he can try and reshare. Okay, sounds good. Go ahead. I am back. Should I try once? Yes. Can you share the terminal? Let me know if you guys can see oh, terminal. Awesome. Okay. We can see you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we can. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that technical glitch. Right. So in today's demo, we'll show how the open tool can be used to extract specific eBPF functionality from large code bases and also automated for point transformation. Right. So for this demo, let's assume that we want to extract uh, specific functionality from uh, Facebook scatterun code base. Right. So specifically, we want to extract the function XTP decap, which is written for the XTP hook point from XTP uh, from decap current.c. Right. So the first step is we run a script that essentially runs a, cert, a set of static analysis and source code transformation rules to generate uh, an annotated function called graph. The annotations include the uh, function definition and struct and eBPF map definitions in their respective source files. So let's look at the output. So the file here essentially represents the annotated function called graph. We'll see that certain functions such as process and capped IPIP packet have multiple definitions. And like Sandeep uh, talked about in the demo, in this case, we will take a developer input and let the developer choose which function they want to use. So for this demo, let's assume that we want to use process and capped from decap current.c, right? So in the next step, we run a Python script that essentially takes in a disambiguated function called graph and goes and extracts out all the functions that are defi defined from their respective source files and dumps it in a single extracted.c under the decap, uh, under the uh, cutrun extracted folder. So let's take a look at that file. Okay. So what you'll see is that all the uh, headers are included with a macro uh, macro guards. What I also want to show here is there is an attention section at the beginning of the file. Essentially, what this shows is that there is the presence of duplicate map definitions, right? One, you know, uh, control array map is defined both in XTP packet counter.c and control data maps.h. Now, similar to function disambiguation, we will take developer input to choose the uh, map definition we want to use. So for, for our demo, let's basically use the one which is in the header file, right? Now next, let's move to the actual function definition, XTP decap. We have included a set of comments that specifies the actual code base, the source code base that we use to extract the code, uh, to extract this function from. We have also added automatically a license at the end of this file, which essentially makes this file ready for verification by the kernel verifier, right? So the next step, let's try to see if the XTP extracted code compiles and can be attached uh, to an interface. So we will compile. Let's make sure we have. Uh, so at, at this point, we don't have an XTP code uh, attached to an interface. Now let me try to attach our extracted code. Voila. We see that our extracted code was able to successfully compile pass the kernel verifier and is now loaded at the XTP hook point on VEF1. The next is I'm going to take this extracted code, which was for an XTP hook point and automatically transform it to run at the TC hook point. The way we do this is to a transformer script, which essentially runs the XTP extracted code to set of TXL and Cochinal transformation rules that replace XTP actions and help functions with TC events. Right, so now let's take a look at uh, you know the extracted code. I mean the transform code. So the first thing we'll notice is that in the transform code, we no longer have any XTP actions. Right, be replaced by a TC equivalence. Now let's see if our transform code 
is compilable and can be attached to any interface. So this, this, okay. Voila. So what we see here is our XDP extractor code was automatically transformed to a TC compatible code and is attached to the TC hook point on V2 interface. So essentially we've been, what we've shown is our open tool can be used to extract specific eBPF functionality from large code bases and can also be used for automatic hook point transformation. Uh, yeah. Uh, over to you, Sandeep. Can you show the slides? Uh, next yep. slide, please. Right, so in terms of future work, uh, next slide. we kind of want to expand the set of transport uh, transformed rules and also want to take community input in terms of you know, which transformations make sense, whether some transformations are not even possible, right? So this is where we are really looking forward to community input and building a larger community in terms of creating you know, modular BPF programs, right? So eventually our goal is to be able to convert open source programs that are then loadable into you know, existing eBPF orchestration frameworks such as Leaf, Polyqube, BPFD, and so on. And along the way, we also want to improve the usability of our framework. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we are very interested in building this community and would encourage everyone uh, and, and, you know, to kind of spread the word and join this community and also give us feedback in terms of which transformations make sense, whether this is, these are even real problems, what are the other problems we should be looking at and so on. Right. Thank you. That's the end of our presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. So, we have a bit of a time, so maybe one or two quick questions if there are any. So, no question from the room. Have you tried to run it on Cilium functions? Did you get anything from Cilium, for example? So Cilium uh, is something uh, we are just getting started with. We have looked at some of the functions. We think they will be transformable, but we haven't at this point played with a lot of Cilium code. OK, thank you. No other questions, so thank you. Thank you.